So section 16 probability is the foundation to get us into section 17. So it's going to be important that we really understand probability before we get to the next section. So by definition, and I'm sure this is not anything new to you, you know, probability is the chance that something's going to happen. And we can write this in any of the three ways, fraction, decimal, or percent. Um, wrong button. Fraction, decimal, or percent, and it really doesn't matter which way. So when you're talking about IV Learn or web work, right, right, either one, thinking quizzes, homework, exams, you want to make sure you read the directions. What does the direction say? If they say a fraction in reduced form, then write it as a fraction in reduced form. If they want it as a decimal, how are you rounding? So make sure you're paying attention to those pieces because that's generally where people get into, into trouble. It's not so much the probability itself. It's how you write your answer. So be, be aware of that. Now, with probability, we have three rules. I don't even know if I would really call them rules. They're more of three things to keep in mind when you're talking about probability. So I want to talk about the third one first, and that's just how we find probability. So the number of ways something can actually happen over your total possibilities. I often refer to that as what I want to have happen over all possible situations. So what I want out of the total. And so your probabilities are always going to start, yep, I can say always, they're always going to start as a fraction. And then from there, we can change to decimal and percent if we need to. Now, when you talk about the first two, probability must be between 0 and 1 inclusive. Inclus inclusive simply means that we can have a probability of 0, we can have a probability of 1, and anything in between. But you can't have something less than one, or less than zero or greater than one. So a probability of zero, does anybody know what a probability of zero tells us? Not possible, exactly. So the probability of me ever being an Olympic basketball player is zero. Right, it's never going to happen. So uh, if you have a probability of zero, it's not possible. Okay, so then what's the probability? If we have a probability that's equal to one, what does that happen? What does that mean? I could say the probability of you having homework over this section is one. Because the probability of 1 means 100%, and that means it's definitely going to happen. Yeah, not that it's just, it's not only that it's possible, but it's definitely going to happen. So the closer your probability is to 1, the more likely it is to happen. It's true. Yes, that's why if you look at weather, weather forecasting is all probability. So the probability, you know, if the, the percent of rain, chance of rain is 80%. Well, 80% is pretty close to 100, right? You, you go, you take an umbrella to work with you. If the chance of rain is zero, I mean, it's not going to rain today, then I'm not taking an umbrella. So if we have a 100% chance that something is happening, it's definitely going to happen. So it's true. It's a, yes, it's definitely going to happen. And But generally, we have stuff in between zero and one. Very seldom is something zero. Very seldom is something one. It's usually something in between. And then this middle one, the sum of all probabilities must be equal to 1. So I explain this generally with a bag of Skittles. So think about a bag of Skittles. We have red, orange, yellow, green, and purple Skittles. Right? There are five colors of Skittles. If we would open a bag of Skittles, pour them out, and separate them, we could find the probability of picking out a red one or orange, yellow, right? all five. But then if I would add, because sum means to add, if I would add those five probabilities together, if you think about it, those five probabilities add up to all, right? Because those are the five type, types of candy in that bag. And all means 100%. 100% is one. So when they talk about the sum of all probabilities must be one, it means if you're talking about a particular bag of Skittles, the sum of all probabilities of the separate candies has to add up to the whole thing which gives you 100%. So again, I don't really want to call that a rule. It's more like this is a thing of probability that is just good to keep in mind. Okay, enough talking. Let's do some math. The We're going to roll a six-sided die. What is the probability of rolling a number greater than one? So remember, we're talking about what we want to have happen 
over the total possibilities. So if I'm rolling a six-sided die, how many numbers are greater than one on a six-sided die? Five is correct. Two, three, four, five, six. Five numbers. So we have five possibilities because what we want is a number greater than one and there are five possibilities there. How many total possibilities do we have? Six, exactly. So our fraction is five sixths. Now that's already reduced, and then you could write it as a decimal if you would like. And of course, we could go to a percent from there. So you have an 83% chance of rolling a die and getting a number greater than one. Great. That's basic, pure and simple, probably the easiest problem you're going to have. Okay, enough with the easy ones. Let's move on. For the rest of the time, we are going to be dealing with what I call probability tables. So you will see here we have male and female. And um, I do think that every problem in the rest of 16 deals with this probability table, just so that you kind of get familiar with it. And we have three colors. So we're going to talk about red, blue, and purple. And you can see that um, across this way, right, they add up. We have 40 total males. We have 40 total females. And then if you add this way, the totals of red, blue, and purple. Okay. All right. So in this question, what is the probability that someone likes red? Yeah, know it exactly. So we, remember, we want we want red over the total, and all is easier to write than total. So we have 18 people who like red, and we have 80 people total. So therefore, we've got to have over the total, right? Again, this would we would call this just a basic, a probability question. Pretty straightforward. 18 over 80. You would have to reduce that or write it as a decimal. Generally, I change all of my probabilities to decimals. I think it makes it easier um, because then it's I don't have to worry about reducing my fractions and decimals are, are widely accepted generally. Okay, you guys try one. Same table, but now we're finding the probability that somebody is a female. Okay, so we're looking at females over the total. And as you have all noticed, there are 40 females and 80 total. So you've got your 0.5 or 50%. Very good. Very good. Okay, great. Looks like you guys have the, uh, I'm going to call those the easy ones. Now we're going to get into, um, I don't want to say more complicated because that makes it sound hard, but the ones that have a little bit just different wording. So what is probability of choosing a male who likes purple? So this word here uh, and kind of implies the word and. So now a male who like a man who likes purple. Those are together. That's what we want. We want a man who likes purple. We're looking for the intersection. So if I have here's my men, here's purple. What number is the intersection of male and purple? Ten, exactly. So when you have this and, and sometimes it'll actually show you and, um, but this means intersection. Now the thing about this is that we're still trying, we're still trying to choose a person from the whole group. So this is actually ten over eighty, because from the entire group we want a male who likes purple. So we're picking out just this spot out of the total. And this is where probability starts getting people because it's the wording that sucks. So when you're looking at this problem, they don't specify a single group. We're still looking at it. What is the probability of choosing? So from the entire group, a male who likes purple. Okay. Do you see how that makes sense? If, if something isn't clear, let me know. and I'll try to explain it in a different way. You just need to speak up or type up. Okay, so the key is if you see the word and or you have wording that implies and meaning two things together at the same time, 
you're looking for the intersection. Where do those two things meet? And it will go over the total. Now that's slightly different than this next one, which is or. So I want to do this problem two different ways, and I want you to, to just bear with me on this. So the first way is the statistical method of actual math, and the other one is counting. So just bear with me. So the probability of choosing a female or someone who likes red. Well, here's all my females. Here's all my people who like red. So mathematically, we're looking at the probability of a female plus the probability of somebody who likes red. Now, when I do that, the probability of a female is 40 over 80. The probability that somebody likes red is 18 over 80. The problem is I counted these people twice. So I'm going to subtract the females who like red. I call it subtracting the overlap. So fem probability of females plus probability of red minus the overlap who are the females who like red. So I would subtract 6 over 80. And that gives me 52 over 80 is correct, which is a decimal of 0.65. Now, that is the mathematical way to do it. I prefer it this way because no matter how big your table is or how small your table is, you can do this, this math. Or if you are given data in a different form, you can do it this way. However, if you have a table and you like that, you can say, let me change colors for effect here. You can say, okay, if I want females are red, red, here's red, and here's my females. So if I would add 12, 6, 26, and 8, that also gives me 52 out of 80. So you can also kind of do the counting method, which if you have a smaller table, that works fine. But depending on the size of your table or the way the problem is given to you, it makes it differently. Okay, so there's your two different ways of solving an or problem. So if you see or, we're going to add and then subtract the overlap. Okay. Questions on and or or in terms of probability at this time. Okay. Next one we get to is conditional probability. When we are talking about conditional probability, we have two words that are kind of big clues. One of them is the word given, one is the word if. If you see either of these, they imply a conditional probability. What that means is that we no longer want to deal with the entire group. We only want to deal with a portion of the group. And the portion you want to deal with follows one of these words. So when you're looking at this problem, what is the probability of choosing someone who likes blue given it is a female? Here's my keyword right here. Given it's a female. That means we only care about the females, so the females become my denominator. Probability. Whatever we're trying to find the probability of, that's what we want. So probability of choosing who likes blue. So blue is what's going to go on the top if we're talking about the problem in words. Now, I am focused only on the female line. So my total for females is 40. And out of that line, how many like blue? 26. So I am left with a fraction of 26 over 40, which also happens to be 0.65. So when you see the given or the word if, that's going to tell you what section of your um, table that you're going to focus on. It's going to change your denominator away from the entire group. Okay. All right. So that was a very quick 17 minute overview of section 16. We talked about basic probability and or and conditionals. The wording is what trips people up, right? I believe that you can all write a fraction and then change it to a decimal and a percent. That's a skill that we've worked on and we're good with, but it's the wording of how do you set up that initial ratio that can cause you problems. Now, the more problems you do with this, the easier it gets. So hopefully you spend a little time working through the videos from section 16 and that can help you understand a little bit more. Okay, any other questions on section 16?
Everybody doing okay? Yes, no, a little feedback would be good at this point. Okay, we got a yes, we got an exclamation point even, fabulous. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, all right, so section 17 now is basically the application of section 16. So in section 16, you're given, um, you're given the probability tables and then you play with them. And that's pretty much it. Well, in section 17, we are going to create the probability tables and then answer questions about them. So uh, before we get into this, I'm pretty sure in web work there are videos to go with every homework problem, I think. Um, and if there's not, email me if you need one. Um, but when you, if you get stuck, right, because you're going you're gonna to have to create these tables for all the problems. If you can't get one, your answers are coming up wrong, please, please, please take a picture of your work and send it to me with your question. Because it's so easy when I can see your work and be like, oh, well, you multiplied wrong. Or, oh, you used 95. You should have used 96 or whatever. It's a whole lot easier for me to help you when I can see the steps that you've taken. If you just say, I'm stuck, there are so many steps with these problems. I don't know where you're stuck at. So um, just kind of a general help. I would love to help you, but I would really love to see your work. So help me out there. Okay. Into section 17, false positives and false negatives. So this is, to me, interesting. So think about going to the doctor and being tested for strep throat. And they tell you that, yes, let me get a color here. They say, yes, you tested positive for strep throat. However, you find out you do not have strep throat, right? My example here is you're told you're pregnant, but you're actually not. So you take a pregnancy test. It comes out that, oh, yes, you're having a baby, and then you start freaking out, and then come to find out, no, you're not really pregnant, right? It's a false positive. You tested positive, but it's wrong, okay? On the opposite side, false negative. You test negative, but that's wrong. So you were told you do not have strep throat. You go to the doctor, nope, you're fine. You don't have strep throat. You leave. You're totally infected. You, get every, you give everybody strep throat. So false negative is when you test negative, but it's wrong. Neither one of these things is good, right? The, the wrong test is, is bad in, in any way. Um, and which one you think is worse depends on your situation. I mean, think about just a pregnancy test. You're told you're pregnant, but you're not. That, ha that messes with you. But think about the other way. You're told you're not pregnant, and nine months later, you poop out a baby, right? Those things, both of those, are, are obviously you would figure it out before nine months later. But being told one thing when the other is true is totally, you know, it messes with you a little bit. Okay, so this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with these false positive, false negatives in different types of tests. And that's why it can be very, very interesting. No test is 100% true. Everything has these false positive, false negatives with it. Okay, so we are going to use this fake example that, of course, I created. And 3% uh, of people are allergic to snakes. I guess that could be true. I really don't know. So a test with 92% accuracy can be used to test for this allergy. Use a sample of 50,000 to create a table, and then we're going to answer questions A through D. So it's going to be important that you uh, create this table on the scrap paper in front of you or whatever, because after this slide, I won't have the table anymore. So you're going to have to reference your own table. Okay, so the key is we know we start out with 50,000 people. So that is our overall total, 50,000. And that number really, it's not vital. You could use 100,000, you could use 10,000, you could use 500. That number doesn't really matter. It's a starting point. So we always want to start with an overall total. Okay, from there, we want to fill out the rest of this column. You always want to start with the vertical total column. Do any of you have any idea how we might figure out the other two numbers there? Vanessa, very good. We know, nope, Julie, not 92. We're going to use the three. 3% of people are allergic to snakes. Okay, look at what this says, has the allergy. We know 3% have the allergy. 
Well, our total is 50,000. So, oh, that's a bad color. Let me change colors real quick. We know that 3% of 50,000 have the allergy because 3% of people have the allergy. So 3% is the 0 0.03 of means to multiply. So if we multiply 3% times 50,000, how many people out of 50,000 would we expect to have the allergy? 1,500, exactly. See, and then that, oh man, this is gonna be a pain. 1,500, okay. Now, don't overthink this. If we have 50,000 people total, and 1,500 of them have the allergy, how many don't have the allergy? Forty-eight thousand five hundred. Very good. Right, you can just subtract because you know how many total you have. Okay, so we use, and sometimes they'll tell you fifteen hundred people have the allergy. So sometimes they'll give you that number. Sometimes they give you the percentage, and you just have to think. Okay, I'm talking about having the allergy. What percent? You've really got to work on your wording here because that's what's going to be crucial. Okay, next piece of information. These four blocks in here, these are the four that represent the accuracy. So I tried to color code that there. So, and this is where the common sense comes in. All right, so work with me. I hope your common sense is in full gear today. Let's first talk about those that have the allergy. Okay, so let's th think about yourself. Pretend that you have the allergy, you are allergic to snakes. You know you're allergic to snakes. So if you would go in and have this test done, and you know you have the allergy, would you expect to test positive or negative? Positive, exactly. If you know you have it, you expect to test positive. People, you know, all the time, I think I have strep throat, they go to the doctor, they expect to test positive because that's what they have. So this 92% accuracy rate is going to go in here. I'm going to use an A for accuracy. So 92% of people with the allergy are going to test positive. So let me write that out. 92% of the 1,500 are going to test positive, right? Test positive. Because that's what you expect to have happen. Common sense. If I have it, I would test positive. So I take my 0.92. I multiply it, whatever that right there is, multiply it by 1,500. And yep, Vanessa, you're correct. And somebody else who typed above you. 1380. Okay, again, now think about it. 1500 people have the allergy, 1380 of them test positive. So, how many test negative? 120. If anybody is completely lost, you got to speak up because I'm just going on who's in the chat box, and the chat box people seem to know what's going on. So, speak up if we need to talk through something else. Okay, now do the same thing. Go to the next line. Now we're talking about those who do not have the allergy. So think this way. I am not allergic to snakes, at least not that I know of. So if I go into the doctor's office and they test me to be allergic, how would I expect to test if I know I don't have the allergy? I would expect to test negative. Exactly. I know I'm not pregnant. If I go in and get tested, I should test negative because I'm, you know. Okay, so the accuracy rate falls here. So 92% of 48.5 is going to fall in that test negative. So again, I take my 0.92, I multiply by the 48.5, and as fast as I can write, people are doing math, and we get 44.620. Okay, you probably already know my next question. If we have 48.5 total who do not have the allergy, and 44.620 tested negative, how many tested positive? 3,880. Yeah, no, that happens. I'm glad you got right back in. Okay, so once we have those numbers figured in based off of our percentages, now we can add how many total positive tests did we have? 5,260. And how many total negative tests? 447. Yep. Now, I would ask you to take the six seconds it's going to take and add those two numbers together. Make sure they equal 50,000 because if they don't, you messed something up. 
And that's just an easy way to make sure that you didn't jack that up. Okay. Okay, so you have your table. Any questions on where any of these numbers came from? This is pretty much what you're going to do for every problem in web work. Now, some of them are challenging, and they're supposed to be. Your homework is supposed to challenge you. It's not supposed to always be easy. Um, so again, there are help videos for the challenging ones, um, and if you ever get stuck, you know where to find me. So the next questions, A and B, I'm going to leave on this page because I want to reference the table. Um, I'll just read you the questions because I know what they are. So the first question is, how many false positives are there? Okay, so false positive. So think about what a false positive means. So question A is false positive. A false positive means that you tested positive and it was wrong. So which one of the numbers in this table represents tested positive but wrong? Amanda, you are incorrect. Tested positive. Here's the positive test right here. That means we're looking at this line for positive test. 3880 is correct. A false positive, so this is the false positive right here. A false positive means I tested positive, but it's wrong. Well, if I test positive and I have the allergy, that's true, right? So this is true. That's the accuracy. Accuracy is true. So if I test positive, but I don't have it, that's wrong. So 3,880 people are going to be told you're allergic to snakes, but in actuality, they are not. It's kind of alarming, actually. Okay, then we go to the next one. Let me change colors. Question B is how many false negatives do we have? So remember what a false negative says. You tested negative, but it's wrong. So here's my negative tests. Yep, the word. It's the wording. The math in this stuff is not difficult. As you notice, what have we done? We've multiplied and we've subtracted. And we've done a little adding. This is crap you guys can do in your sleep when it comes to the, to the math. But the wording and probability, it's, that's where it really, it really gets people. So you really have to focus and, and you really got to focus when you do these problems. Okay, so the false negative. You tested negative. So we're in this column, but it's wrong. So think about what would be true. If I test negative, I should be negative. So this is where the truth is. So 120 is the false negative because that's a lie. If I test negative and I have the allergy, that's wrong. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? And again, the more you do these, the more you interact with them, the more you play with them, it'll make sense. Okay, and do you all have the table written down on a piece of paper so that I can ditch this and move on? Hoping the answer to that is yes. Okay, great. Erase the drawings. Boom. So that was false positive, false negatives. So now we're looking at conditional probabilities. So using that table that you can see and I can see, but we can't see it together, given a positive test result, what is the probability someone does not have the allergy? What is the key word in this problem that kind of should set you off? We've only, we only did one of these in the probability section. So, uh, Vanessa, that, the positive test is super important. Yes, and that's, it follows the word given. So given a positive test. So, and the does not, you guys are absolutely right. So give, remember, whatever follows the word given or the word if, those are the two triggers, that tells you what we're focusing on. So the positive test result is going to be our denominator. And then whatever follows probability, someone does not have the allergy, is going to go on top. So in essence, you guys are all right. So this tells us we are only focused on the positive Column. How many total positive tests were there? Fifty two sixty, exactly. So our denominator is fifty two sixty, because that's the total number of positive tests, and we're only looking at that positive column. Now, in that positive column, how many do not have the allergy? 
3880. And so there is the probability that given a positive test result, someone not having the allergy. Now, of course, that's a really crappy fraction. It should be reduced. So instead of reducing, let's go ahead and change that to a decimal. What is 3880 over 5260 as a decimal? 0.738. And if you change it to a percent, it'd be 73.8%. You're good. You're good. So 73.8% of positive tests are wrong. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Because if you don't have the disease, you shouldn't be testing positive. So 74% so of positive tests are not true. Doesn't that strike anybody else as just odd? I mean, and this is a, this is how things happen generally, really. There are way more fa false positive than false negatives. I should say a higher percentage. Slightly spooky. Yeah, and it could, depending on what we're talking about. I mean, you know, if we're talking about some deadly virus, you test positive, they quarantine you, and you're fine. That could really mess with your life. Let's hope that doesn't happen anytime soon. Okay, try this one. Given a negative test result, what is the probability someone does not have the, or does have the allergy, excuse me? Okay, let's look at this one. Given negative tests. So our denominator is all the negative tests. Ooh, look how straight that line is, you guys. That's a good one. What is probably someone does have the allergy? So we want does on the top. So allergic on the top. What does that look like with numbers? Okay, as a fraction, yeah. Amanda, I'm not really sure what you just typed in there. So 120 over 44,740 is correct. Yeah, Amanda, I have no idea what you typed in. If you change it to a decimal, you get 0 .003, which would be 0.3%. Not even a full percent. I do recommend that you write down the fractions for these and then change them to a decimal. Um, if you think about, you know, the exam when you're showing your work, if you type something into your wrong into your calculator, then you just get a wrong answer, and I can't give you any partial credit. But if you write down the fraction and you had the fraction correct, but you typed it in wrong, then I can still give you partial credit. Okay, Amanda, did you get that fraction? Okay, and you typed in 120 divided by, so 120 goes into your calculator first. You might be in a weird setting in your calculator. Oh, I think I know. Okay, so you said 2.68. Your calculator gave you this. Ha, ha, ha. I know what that means. This scientific notation, the negative third implied scientific notation, if you move your decimal one, two, three places, shh, these are both zeros. This six rounds up, which would give us the point zero, zero, three. 
So your calculator gave it to you in scientific notation. Whew, that tested me right there. I was, I was getting nervous that I didn't know what the heck was going on, and that was a scary feeling for me. But we got that. We got that. So there you go. That's a scientific notation business. I'd give you a high five, but my computer doesn't like it when I smack it. So good. Okay. So that is um, section 17. How do you feel about section 17? The only real new part of it is, is the creating of the tables. And they can be a little shaky. But um, in the back of your, so there's a couple of them in your packet, right? You can go through before you get to your homework. And then in the back of the packet, there is, there's more practice. I think there's like four of them back there and they all have videos to go with them. And again, if you can't find them or you need help, whatever, just shoot me an email. Um, I'm going to be on campus tonight till like eight. So I'll be checking my email throughout that. I mean, I have class and different things going on, but I'll be on my computer all day today and all day tomorrow. I have meetings and stuff and I'll be on my computer. So, um, you know, hit me up. I'm here to help. And uh, we'll go from there. So, okay. So let's go to section 18. Section 18 is the, I don't know if I would call it the easiest, but it's the, it's the least mathematical <laughs> of, of the three. Um, it's a lot more terminology. So it's more words. Absolutely. So this front page, we're going to kind of talk about um, these five pieces. So when it comes to, the problems, you're going to have to answer these types of questions. And the first thing we need to talk about is the difference between a population and a sample. So in section 18, we're talking about polling, um, you know, having like uh, going out and, and surveying people and, and talking about those kind of things. So the difference between a population and a sample, does anybody know, first of all, what that means or the difference between them? And it's okay if you say no. I just thought I would ask before I just start yammering. Okay, I'm going to go with nobody knows since nobody's answering, and that's totally fine. Um, oh, there we go. A sample is a smaller group. It's a sample of the population. Yes, yes, that is a good, good thing. Julie. Yes, you have a key word there. I don't know if you guys are Googling or what, but I appreciate your efforts. Population, the key word there, and Julie put it in the chat box, is all. So let's say I want to talk to adults in the U.S. about their, their favorite bottle of water. Favorite bottle of water. So if the population would be all adults in the U.S. Now, would it be practical for me to talk to every adult in the United States? No, right? That is just preposterous to think I could even think about doing that. There's just way too many people. So the sample is part of the population, and we usually give it a particular number. So instead of, okay, so I'm going to pull, I'm going to talk to adults in the U.S. The population is all the adults, because those are, that's the possibility of what I could do. I'm only going to talk to 40 adults, and they're probably all going to be in Warsaw, Indiana, right? So the pop the sample is part of the population, and it's usually a particular number. So the sample might be 40, where the population is all. Okay, so there's the difference between those two. Very good, very good, very good. All right, then we have a margin of error. So think about the margin of error um, as kind of like the variation in responses. And let me go a little bit more in detail with that. So if I'm surveying adults in the United States about their favorite bottled water and I only talk to 40 people, it's very possible that those 40 people don't think like the rest of the 320 million people in the U.S., right? I guess I'm talking adults. It's less than that, but whatever. So the margin of error gives us like a plus minus. So 30% of people like... Kroger brand bottled water, plus or minus 4%. It gives you a leeway to be right or wrong. So you, you end up with a, a range of possibilities for your, for your answers. Think about, um, you know, I hate uh, election years because it's, you know, that's all you hear about. But election years are great for math. So when you're talking about going out of who are you voting for, they never talk to all registered voters. They talk to 2,000 people across the country. And then so they say, you know, 
35% of people are voting for Donald Trump, plus or minus 4%. And that gives them a leeway to be wrong based off the fact that other people think differently. So that margin of error is the ability to be wrong, basically. And we find the margin of error in this course by taking 1 over the square root of n. And you might be saying, well, what is n? n is the sample size. So if we only talk to 40 people, then n is 40. If I talk to 2,000 people, then n is 2,000. The larger your sample size, the better your data, so the smaller your error. That should make sense logically. All right. Now, when we talk about this, we are talking about a 95% confidence only. In this course, this is what we focus on. 1 over the square root of n is a simplified estimated formula for this. If you get into statistics where you deal with a ton of confidence intervals, there is a much more sophisticated formula, and you can find all, all types of confidence levels. So if you end up taking a stats course down the road somewhere in your educational life, this is not going to be, the concepts are going to be in there, but this dingy little formula is not. Just want to throw that out there. Okay, so the 95% confidence, this, these things are kind of together. We get this confidence interval. The confidence interval is the range of accepted values. Remember how I, I my example that I was talking through was like 45% of people voted, you know, said they would vote for Trump plus or minus 4%. Well, if your survey gave you 45% plus or minus 4%, where 4% is your margin of error, then your confidence interval would be 41 to 49. If you think about that, because 45 minus 4 is 41, and 45 plus 4 is 49. So the confidence interval gives you this range of values. So you could expect on election day that somewhere between 41 and 49% of people will vote for Donald Trump. That's kind of what this, this is. And it's a way to estimate what's happening. Okay? All right. That's very abstract. I talked a lot. Let's work through a problem and kind of see how these pieces all fit together. And we'll do a little bit of math. And then we'll be done. Okay. And this is also made up data by me. A recent survey of 2,400 U.S. adults found that 36% of adults think the Cubs are overrated. I am a Yankee fan, so of course I used the Cubs are overrated. So, and if you're a Cubs fan, that's fine. I mean, I won't hold that against you forever, but whatever. So, when we're looking at this, we're going to answer the first two questions are words and or numbers, but no real math. So, what is the population here? Remember, the population is all of the potential people that we could talk to, but sometimes it's a particular group. So all of one group. Is there a particular group that we are talking to in this particular survey? Okay. Um, Amanda, you are absolutely correct. Vanessa, you have that number in there. With the population, there is no number. So the population is just all U.S. adults because the survey for the population, it's everybody that we could have talked to. So we could have talked to all U.S. adults. Again, that's preposterous. It's never going to happen. So the sample is where the number comes in. The sample is how many people did we actually talk to? And that's where your 2,400 comes in. So there's the 2,400 U.S. adults. Do you see the difference between the population and the sample? Because that's the big key. Population is po all possibilities. Sample is just the ones we actually talk to. Okay, so now we're going to calculate our margin of error. So the margin of error gives us our leeway, right? It's that plus or minus percentage. So remember, our formula is 1 over the square root of n. What is n in this particular problem? 2,400, right. So I take 1 over the square root of 2,400. Now, depending on your calculator, some of you might have to find the square root of 2,400 first and then take 1 divided by that answer. Some of you will be able to type it in exactly like you see it. Either way, let's go to the nearest percent. Vanessa, there you go. 
ends up at 0 0.02, and that's a 2% margin of error. Anybody have questions on how to get that? Generally, that's a calculator, depending on your calculator thing, right? So 1 divided by the square root of 2,400. Okay, good. Then we go to our confidence interval. Now, our confidence interval starts with what we call the point estimate in statistics, and that's what the survey showed. So the survey showed 36%. So I start with my 36%, and then it's plus or minus the margin of error, which we just found to be 2%. So if I have 36 plus or minus 2, what's the low end of my interval? 34, very good, because 36 minus 2 is 34. What's the upper end? 38. And there's my confidence interval. Okay. So far, have I lost anybody? Everything makes sense? Again, the math is not difficult. You can all divide, multiply, right? The math part isn't the hard part. It's now we have new terminology. We have new sentences. We have, new, you know, we're adding new crap to it, which is always fun. Okay, and then the last piece, writing a statement to answer your answer to part, to use part D. So we're going to use this confidence. Now the key is our level of confidence is 95%, right? We are not 100% sure that this is how it's going to be. We're 95% sure. 95% allowed us to use this formula, okay? So we could say we are 95% confident. And yes, you have to have that 95% confident in there because that shows your confidence level. 95% confident that between 34%, oops, 34% and 38%. And who did we talk to? We talked to U.S. adults. Of U.S. adults think... The chubbies are overrated. I don't know how they're going to be this year. Should be exciting. And that would be a meaningful sentence. It gives us our confidence level. It gives me my confidence interval. And who we're talking to, right? The U.S. adults, there's my population, and what they're talking about. So you really have to make sure you have those four pieces in there. How confident are you? What is your interval? Who did you talk to? And what are they doing? You have those four pieces. You're golden. All right. Questions? That's basically section 18 in a nutshell. Math isn't hard. It's just making sure you do enough examples that the all of the, the words and everything make sense in your head. That's the key. A lot of people do it and they're like, oh man, that is so easy. They do one example and they don't do anymore. And then when it comes exam time, they forget because there, there wasn't enough repetition. So don't skimp on the repetition um, just because it's not as difficult as other things. Okay. Okay. So uh, that's the end of today. Remember that next week is exam two. Therefore, you take the exam anytime you want during the week, make an appointment. If you haven't already done so, make it today. And then next week's live session will just be question and answer. I will be on from 10 to or 12 to 1. Um, and it's I will have nothing planned. You guys can come in if you if you have questions, I'll be here and answer anything and everything that you have. Um, they can be answers or questions about uh, the exam itself, any of your you know homework that you want to go back and revisit project questions, um, the review, exam review quiz questions, anything and everything. So don't forget to do the exam review quiz. That is open and available. Highest grade is kept. So you can do it as many times as you want. And if you do it once and you don't understand why some of your answers are wrong, you know, shoot me an email. I can get in and look at everything that you guys do so I can answer specific questions on those two. So, all right. Well, if you guys don't have any other questions, I'm done. So um, 
go forth, do math, enjoy your day. Um, don't forget about project two or, or exam two. Those are both big, big grade pieces. And uh, you know where to find me if you need me. Thanks for coming. Have a good day.